What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Random Red Shirt Podcast. I am one of the hosts, Zach, and the other host is Chris. What's going on, buddy? Hello, Zach. Awesome to be here, Zach. We're so I I feel very privileged. We're so thrilled. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. We it's just it it is so lovely. Thank you, Nana. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here with you too. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is an absolute uh, treat. We are humble and honored to welcome Nana Visitor to the podcast. Uh, Nana is an incredibly talented and accomplished actress. I don't need to tell you guys watching or listening to this. She's worked on Broadway, television, and film. She's appeared in shows such as Ryan's Hope, Remington Steel, The Twilight Zone, Knight Rider, MacGyver, Night Court, Matlock, Frazier, CSI, Battlestar Galactica, Torchwood Castle, and I, I could just keep going on and on. She's also appeared in films such as the 2009's Friday the 13th, Swing Vote with Kevin Costner, among others. However, we of course know her as the one and only Major Kira Norris, the Bajoran first officer on the greatest Star Trek series of them all, Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Nana, this really is an absolute pleasure to have you join us. So thank you so much for being here on the Random Red Shirt Podcast. The pleasure. I'm happy to be here with you too. Thank you. Uh, so we love to, when we have people on and on, we love to go in the Wayback Machine. In fact, this new Star Trek Strange New Worlds episode that just came out deals with a little bit of this. And we're going to time travel. We want to go back in time and start from the very beginning. Now, my understanding is that you come from a theatrical family, right? I do. I do. It's uh, it, it's. A lot of my family are like mythological creatures. <laughs> Sid Alexander Siddig described them as that when he met them. And they are. My grandmother was a young woman when she decided to join the Paris Opera. And you weren't supposed to be married. Mm. But she was. And after she went, she came home and trained her 11 children that she had to dance. And so they went on the vaudeville circuits, which was, you know, the big theatrical thing to do. It was the time of Isidore Duncan and they were dancers and they traveled the world. And eventually my mother ended up a dance teacher in New York and a, quite a famous one and uh, married my father, who was a choreographer. So it was a theatrical, very bohemian life that I grew up in. What, yeah, I mean, did you... Um... As long as you can remember, have you wanted to be in the performing arts and become a dancer and an actress and all that or no? No, no, oh. I didn't. I wanted to be a writer. Mm. I didn't want to do it. I was like the oh. black sheep of the family. But uh, it was pretty obvious. I went to this fancy girls school and, you know, got into Princeton and did all that stuff. And it was like, I want to be a writer. And I remember my history teacher going, you're not, you're an actor. It's like obvious you're an actor so uh that's what I did I, I was very active in school doing that so I think that's why it became obvious and it was like so many actors say it was the place where I was safe to be who I was to be the strange combination of human characteristics that made up me uh, and I didn't have to be performative in any way. And that was a joyful place. And just for the safety alone, I think I gravitated to the stage. Wow. Wow. Well, well, in your desire to be a writer, were there any, just out of curiosity, were there any writers that you loved, like growing all up? All of them. Wow. All, all of them. I read constantly. And if I didn't have a book, I read an aspirin bottle. It was... <laughs> <laughs> I had to be reading and I thought there's not no better storytelling than being a writer, but, uh, and because it transported me to so many different worlds, but really I found that my way, my most effective way of storytelling was as an actor. So how did, um, writing eventually turn into becoming an actress and eventually to Broadway? I, you know, I, I had to do one of those senior projects mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was like, what am I going to do? I'll guess I'll do something. And I auditioned, believe it or not, as a dancer in Summerstock, a pretty famous Summerstock back East called Goodspeed Opera House. And I got the job and I did a season as a dancer and I was 17 years old. And they counted that toward my 
project, my senior project, because I was graduating while I was doing this job. And then I just started to work. I had gotten into Princeton, so I started to defer. I think I deferred for about four years, but it was like, I'm working and I'm doing what I want to be doing. Do I wish I'd had that experience? Probably. Do I think my parents could have afforded it? Absolutely not. Mm. So, you know, it it it's how it all unfolded. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you were you worked for a while and then you're and then getting into the TV and those those spots did that kind of like evolve naturally. Like, yeah, it did. Yeah. I just I got I I got a, with such ease. I wish there was such ease these days to get agents, but uh -huh. with huge ease, I got an agent and I just started going out and I started working non pretty much nonstop. Mm. And I thought I'd never leave New York. I didn't see a reason to leave New York. I loved it so much. But uh, finally, after a couple of Broadway shows, I got a tour uh, of 42nd, starring in 42nd Street, uh, to go to L.A. And that's how I landed in L.A. And I started to do TV out in L.A. Mm. And it felt like the, you know, it's like, at a certain point, you go, I got to do L.A. as an actor. You go, it's just, it's where everything was at the time. It, since then, it's a very, I mean, everything about the business is so different. But back then, it was like you did New York and hoped you could find a home in Los Angeles and do the big prize TV. Mm. Well, you've done a lot of unbelievable TV shows and spots. Uh, I, there's a, definitely a couple that I think we really want to talk about. Uh, the first one for me is MacGyver. I, I grew up on MacGyver. I love that show. And it's actually funny. So when I was, you know, going through and doing some research, one of the things I, I, I noticed was one of the episodes that you were in. You were in two episodes, I believe, of MacGyver. And the first one was pretty early on in the show. I think it was within like the first 10 episodes Yeah. Um, called Hellfire. And where you're a long lost or not long lost, but you're a long time, you know, friend of MacGyver and, and uh, you and your husband uh, in the show are out drilling oil out in the middle of the, the woods somewhere uh, trying to to make it rich. And I'm curious, first of all, how did that did that just come about like the normal you went out and, and auditioned for it or how did that role come about? And do you by chance remember where you guys filmed that? I wish I did. I wish I knew when I was. Uh, driving out there at five in the morning knew where it was because I remember you know what were those map books that we had oh and, yeah Randall McNally yeah <laughs> yeah we had these map. it was called something else but we had these map books and you'd be looking at it in the car going now where where am I supposed to go what freeway and I was totally lost and I remember stopping on the side of the road and hailing a trucker who stopped for me going I'm lost I'm supposed to be here where is that? And he he guided me in. But it was I I was new to driving. It was past the 118. So it was way out there. And I know that there was some kind of awful lake, which was more like just, you know, swamp, because I remember <laughs> having to run out there. And the horrible thing was I was wearing a Vega and I fell in the swamp and ruined the vega so yeah it was like d don't worry about bacterial infections with the actor it's the, the equipment. <laughs> that's expensive equipment but uh richard dean anderson was delightful I, but it's interesting um from that show and then i don't remember what season it was i came back and did an additional show but from that show where the whole crew and everybody was like yeah let's go and yes so energetic and playing music as we were going out in the trucks to the you know location the next time I came back <laughs> Richard Dean Anderson wasn't coming out of his trailer to <laughs> it was like, you know everyone's a little angry you get tired especially on a show like that it is 
ridiculously exhausting to show up at remote sets to work those hours it's more of a grind than anyone ever really realizes hmm. yeah and he did i think seven seasons of macgyver so i mean How macgyver shows, there's, do you know do i you don't know, know i don't remember the specific number of episodes but that i mean that was back then when tv you were getting 20 some episodes a season right not like it is now where it's like 10 or 8 no i know it's mm-hmm. so human now but back then it was serious stuff really yeah. i it's it's almost impossible to physically keep up with it. Yeah. And these these were your experiences like um, on a lot of the shows that you were on. I mean, you were on some you were on some iconic shows like Knight Rider and Remington Steel and they were all like with that sense and that grind and working that hard. Yeah, and that's where you know where number 1 on the call sheet if they've got the grit because if they are kind to guest stars coming in uh even after a long run they are they they need to be number one because that's it's not easy it, but number one on the call sheet just doesn't mean that you it, it's not just that you're the star it's you are setting the tone mm-hmm. this is your set and how are you going to run it how are you going to be responsible for the people how are you going to treat the crew because that's how everyone else will too. It's really an important position. Yeah. So obviously you were on shows like with Richard Dean Anderson and, um, you know, so many iconic Kelsey Grammer. Uh, I mean, the cast of the reboot of Battlestar Galactica was just loaded with amazing talent. Oh. Um, abs- I mean, I mean, especially um, Edward James Olmos. I mean, he's something special. Uh you were also on a show with, in my opinion, the greatest James Bond of all time, and that's Pierce Brosnan and Remington Steele. So what was your experience like working on that show? He's a good number one. He was a wonderful number one. He was so, so decent as a human being. He really took the time to be human. Yeah, he was great. And that really influenced me as to, you know, I was number two on the call sheet in Deep Space Nine. But it influenced me how I wanted to treat guest stars and crew because I really saw you're you're pretty much at the mercy of everybody when you're a guest star or this is the way it was back then. You know, it's so fast. It's such a grind. No one's going to take time with you. No one's going to give you extra shots. Oh, I didn't like what I did there. Tough. Just mm. It's it's all going to keep running, and you better not mess up, because you know you're hired help. You're so that really showed me what a difference it can make to someone's performance and to someone's day on a set if someone takes the time to be decent. Hmm. So um, yeah, it's it's something that's paid forward constantly. That's beautiful. You make them feel human. Yeah. And you remember that it's collaborative and that you're there to act, not just get the day done. You know, this is what we do. Take the time and the moment to connect to do that. Wow. So, so before, before Star Trek, do you have any favorites of like, whether, whether there were, television or 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 broadway or these favorite special moments that you know you're very fond of broadway yeah broadway certainly going on for twiggy in tommy toon's musical my one and only on broadway that was magical and frightening and i didn't know the show because she was nervous about having her understudy watch rehearsals because she wasn't a dancer she was a top mega model. So um, she didn't want anyone watching. And I was her understudy. So I didn't get to watch. So when they put me on, I had four hours to learn multiple tap numbers and songs. <laughs> I knew the songs. That was easy to pick up. But the tap numbers, no, I did not know. So it was, um, and I remember a moment of being, a 
took all my stuff from my chorus room dressing room and I set it up in Twiggy's uh, star dressing room. And it's the only time I talk to myself out loud. And I looked in at myself in the mirror and I said, you can run and I will forgive you, but you can also do it. And whatever happens, they're lucky because I don't know the show. So we can take the chance, but forgive yourself. Either way, forgive yourself if you run or you don't. And that was the first time I went into a flow state mm -hmm. as an actor. And I was in a flow state for that whole show. And it was like, oh. And of course, in the years following, I, I chased that feeling going, what is that? How do I get there? Until I read Mihai Cheek sent me his book and learned how to get there. That act that is that's amazing because at that time you didn't know what or you were experiencing a flow state, but you're no. not sure like what what no, it is. I didn't no. know what that was. Mm -hmm. It was just this magical place where suddenly I could think and I'd have it seemed like 10 minutes before I had to do the next thing. I had time changed quality and I was connected to everybody and yet more connected to just myself that I was like, what is this state? Mm. What is this place of being? And of course you can't, you cannot chase it. <laughs> yeah. Clarity of thought, right. And the ability to so maybe, really be in control of your, your thoughts. Yeah. That, that place. Yeah. So, uh, you know, be, we had one of my dear, dear friends on with us recently, Natalia Nugalich, who played Admiral Nechev. She was on a couple episodes of D Space Nine and gave Cisco a run for his money. Um, and one of the things she said to us was that the theater is the actor's medium, television is the writer's medium, and um, movies is the director's Thank medium. You. And I'm curious, yeah, I'm curious, Nana, uh, your thoughts on that from having done all three, like how, how, how really different is it from being on stage and from a live audience versus in front of a camera and doing, doing television and filming? They all seem so vastly different yet similar in certain ways. I think she's absolutely right. Um, theater, there's a sense that once you step on stage, it's yours, nobody else's, and it's not going to stop unless you stop. Uh, and whatever happens, it's, that it's your bubble to to keep in the air. Um, film, I don't like because it is the director's medium. And it's and unless they're collaborative, you are you might as well be a puppet. I mean, because mm -hmm. they can catch you going like this. And if that's what they want, that's what they use. And it's got nothing to do with this creative process. So I pretty much I there were many reasons I wasn't that interested in film. I do independent films now because there's something about that that's very compelling. But big movies, it was like, I feel like a meat puppet. Mm -hmm. um, TV, especially something like Deep Space Nine, I loved the subtle collaboration with the writers mm -hmm. where it's like a a, a a call and repeat what do you call that is that what you call it it like in church is someone says something and then it's said back and it's this yeah like an amen basically yeah it's like uh it's it, they said the words and then we said them in a way they hadn't thought of which mm -hmm. made them write the words differently next time and it's just like it's this wonderful strange who ends where and we, I never saw them, but still we were in deep collaboration. So um, I do like that. I also like that it's like guerrilla warfare. It's so fast. It, you don't have time to work on it or think about it. You have to go and you have to use your instincts. And it's really challenging and scary. It's as challenging and scary as, as as being on stage is. And I love that place. Mm. Oh, that is, oh, that's incredible. Actually, that's very, very, very cool. Very cool. So you, you got 
to collaborate with the writers on on DS9 did you feel like you got to interject um some of who you felt Kiro was to to the writers did they kind of were they receptive yeah. to that I mean they hired me so there's like there's something about me that they wanted as the tone of the character so yeah I mean I certainly ran with it I took their words and interpreted it the way I wanted Kira to live and uh and it kept going that way amazingly enough and yet they were smart enough to give her this wonderful arc of growth mm. out of post-traumatic stress and into understanding politics and under and becoming more sophisticated she's no longer just a grunt but she has to learn uh to to play chess mm. although yeah. that grunt is always always <laughs> thinner yeah for sure uh, now i know you said you you, you maybe kind of stayed away from movies a little bit just because you like the theater and the television medium a little more uh, being a part of an iconic franchise like Friday the 13th, obviously this, and I, looking over your resume, Nana, and the things that you've done, this is seems pretty different from a lot of the stuff that you've done, a horror movie, right? Um, as an actress, I'm very curious about, compared to doing, you know, your your, your standard, like, well, I don't say standard, but it plays and musicals and, and television shows, things like that. How do you prepare to do a horror or a thriller movie? Like, are you drawing upon something to really get yourself in that, like, scared, scared to death kind of mindset to portray that on screen? Well, just to put it into perspective, I've played bugs at least three times in my career. <laughs> so, you know, just that Friday the 13th is the most uh, visible horror movie I've done mm. doesn't mean that I haven't done so gotcha. uh, I was not I it it always it was like wait a minute why is she naked and then she gets killed I never wanted to do that that seemed kind mm. of misogynistic and bizarre and scared of teenage sexuality so that was like never going to happen for me uh, luckily the only time I did that kind of show was when I was much older but to me, she was a mother. She was a mother and just was trying to reason with what was going on. But I'll tell you something. That wasn't my voice. That was not my voice. My I was I was called for looping and I was never informed because, of course, it was raining and this was going on. And it was a crazy night in, in Texas that night. Uh, they, they called me for looping and my manager was having some emotional issues and didn't contact them or me mm. and they tried and tried and tried and finally hired someone. That was not my performance. That's wow. not the performance I would want to do because to me, she wasn't, yeah. that's so typical horror to me. She was right. like, no, let me explain to you why I need to kill you. Let's just be reasonable. This mm. has to happen. And and that's why they hired me, but that's not what ended up. It, it's just one of those things. Mm. So the big part of that show for me, besides being in the rain and running through it, was getting the makeup done so that they could cut my head off. And it was mm. old school at that time. It was straws in your nose. Ooh. And I knew it was going to be bad when one of the makeup artists said, I'll stay here and hold your hand. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, this is going to be. And sure enough, it was bad. Wow. Uh, yeah, I have claustrophobia. I don't know how I made it through that because it really feels like you're drowning. Now, I'm sure they have better ways of doing it today but then it was old school how long were they in that process in the makeup process uh three days i don't know oh, wow. <laughs> don't know i don't know oh it felt like three days oh. it had to be at least 15 20 minutes i think which is like a long time to try to keep yourself calm when you're oh. totally encased in uh prosthetic material 
Mm. My goodness. Yeah. Well, uh, so you go through all some of these uh, iconic series and shows and so forth early on. And then we start getting and working closer towards getting on D Space Nine. Now, my understanding was from watching some different interviews, and I, I think you had mentioned this on the Shuttle Pod show. Um, there were a couple of the actors for some of the parts that had to audition a number of times. I think I remember you saying like Renee had to audition something close to nine times or something. Yeah, I think that's right. Mine was very fast. Mine was very fast. But I don't think they they saw they wanted a Clint Eastwood kind of character for. Odo and Renee changed their minds. So of course there's going to be more auditions, but I think I was pretty much on, on the head of the nail of what they were looking for in Kira. So that was really quick. It was very quick. I had just had my son three, no less than three months before. And uh, I, I was feeling like a soldier. It was like, yeah, here I am. I can barely make it, but let's go. And that was my attitude. Yeah. Now, had you had you seen or watched or been a science fiction fan or watched any Star Trek prior to trying out for Deep Space Nine? You know, when I was or auditioning, working, I should say. Yeah. When I was working on Broadway, I watched Star Trek. I mean, didn't we hmm. all? It was on Channel 11, I think at 630. My call at the at the theater would be 730. So I'd eat dinner and watch the show and go to work. Hmm. And that was just my routine. I watched it every night. And that's what I knew. And I lived through Kirk. I wanted to be Kirk and uh, loved the show. But then, no, I didn't have any connection. And at the time, really science fiction is where you went to die as an actor mm. and I was in my 30s and it was like it was a do or die time and do you take the bird in hand or do you try to make it with a real show on network tv because that's mm. the way it was now it's totally flipped now science fiction is probably the best job you could get back then it was a career killer mm. so you know it was this part that ah, I wanted to do more than any part I'd ever wanted to do. But at the same time, that could be the end of it for me. So it was, so I refused it the first time. I said, no, because my manager said, don't do it. Career killer. Yes, we all know. Uh, and then Rick Berman called me and explained the sets and the writers and the care and and I I went yep let's do it and did it affect my career probably um I don't regret it not for one day not for one day I can't tell you how many young women how many young men how many old women and old men I talked to who found something in the show or in my performance in Kira. And it's like, well, this connection with all these people globally, mm -hmm. uh, that as, as a storyteller, it just doesn't get better than that. Well, and it has had a, a huge impact. And Kira is such a, uh, a passionate leader uh, for for so many people. You mentioned that you said that, that part was something you wanted to do more than any other part. So at the what at the beginning, what drew you to that? Like what qualities of of Kira? She was Christopher. Everything I wasn't doing in terms of work then. I was someone's girlfriend, someone's dead girlfriend, someone's wife, the mother who says, don't be on the couch. Uh, I was performatively female uh, and couldn't hope for anything more than two-dimensional. 
Mm -hmm. I wanted to be Kirk. I wanted to do stuff. I wanted to have agency. I wanted to get the chance to be wrong and make it right. I wanted the chance to be swashbuckling or or to be in the tense moments with an enemy. I didn't get the chance to do that as a woman in the 90s. The only place you could do that was science fiction and being an alien. Being an alien meant I didn't have to play by any rules. I was no longer herded into this reasonable, okay space for a woman to be in. And that was being who I am naturally. That was like freedom, freedom. And at the time people were like, oh, she's what? What are you doing? But that's just because culturally she wasn't okay. I truly was that. I wasn't pushing, acting like a man. It's who I am. But that spectrum of allowing wasn't open to us then. I think I remember you saying either at a convention one year or on an interview that when you first read Major Kira and read the character, you thought it was written for a man, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I absolutely did. I can I can see the the words Major Kira going. I see how this happened. It's ending in an A, so they thought it was a woman, but this is obviously a man's role. She's this this character is coming up against the commander and talking freely and doesn't care if she's likable. This this is not for me. This this is wrong. And they went, no, they they want a woman. Yeah, well, I'm thank goodness you did it. I can't imagine anybody else doing it any better yeah. or anybody else, period, in that role than you. Um, people who watch us and listen to us all the time know that I uh, I'm obsessed with and constantly <laughs> reference D Space Nine. It is my favorite series, as you might have guessed by the intro. Um, and so I look at D Space Nine. To me, it is the greatest written show in the Star Trek franchise. It had the greatest writing. I think it had the greatest character development and the greatest story arcs. You look at even some of the characters who were recurring characters and the story arcs they got is stuff that people, they may never have gotten on another series. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And so you talked about this kind of interplay, right? Where you, you would do things a certain way and that would maybe kind of change the, the writer's perspective and how they would write for you going forward. I'm curious if you've ever come across that again in your career since D space nine. I think to a certain degree, all writers do it, but the, I mean, look, look at the writers we had. Ira Steven, Bear, Brandon Braga, Ron Moore, mm. whose new show I adore, you know, but they all went on, it, it, Renea Shaveria, they all went on to do these iconic shows on their own and they were all in a room together. They were all in a room together watching us and going, hey, what about, <laughs> it's a dream come true. Yeah, they might've had the greatest collection of writers on D Space Nine, bar none to any other show. Brian Fuller, not, I mean, you know, these these big content creators. Yeah. But I, I will give a lot of credit to Ira Stephen Bear for creating that culture in the room of running his writer's room the way he he ran it. And there were more writers I'm not naming right now and I can't think of, and they were unbelievable. The writer who did duet, mm. uh, you know, there are just so many. Duet is, is that is one of your favorite episodes, duet? Is that? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and I thought it was gonna be a mess. I thought, oh my God, we're not gonna be able to cut this together. It's just a mess. And I couldn't find Harris, it, you know, because coming on as a guest star, please, please, first of all, at that time, you didn't have monologues like this long that you had to memorize over, you know, seven days. Mm -hmm. You didn't have massive makeup that you mm -hmm. had to get used to and go, how do I find myself in all of this it takes a moment it a, a lot of the guest stars 
I think that's why they had to be of such a high caliber because not everyone can do it. Not everyone can hit that tone that you have to hit. And he was, I, I think he had difficulty with the makeup and the massive amount of words he said. So there were a lot of takes and I thought, oh, this is gonna be a mess. But when they cut it together, it's one of the best performances. It makes me cry every time I watch it. Mm. He's, he's heartbreaking. He's heartbreaking. Yeah. Things have definitely changed over the years since DS9 first aired. And in particular, nowadays, we have the advent. I think I'm using that word correctly, Chris. <laughs> the advent of streaming services, uh, which have created a binge culture, right? We can binge watch yes. shows. And I truly believe that there has been a surge in DS9 fans due to this because they got to watch the show the way I think it's truly meant to be, which is from beginning to end versus just plopping in and watching, you know, new planet of the week or something yeah. like that ha a a a as a, as a, uh, you know, a main character on that series. Have you noticed any change in the number of DS nine fans? Zach, it's so funny. At, at just, I don't know how far into the, into the pandemic we were, but at one point on Twitter, someone said DS nine is trending. Why? <laughs> it's like because it was unexpected we were the black sheep of the family it's mm. like but then people started to actually watch it and yeah uh we would have existed in this streaming society because i think we would have done better um because we weren't for everyone back then, but mm -hmm. now they can do Star Treks where they're targeting certain audiences. And DS9, although I think DS9 is pretty pretty mainstream at this point. Mm -hmm. There's there's nothing that upsets people too much. But at the time, of course, we were ruining Star Trek. Oh, yeah, that was... You know, it's funny. I mean, I grew up on mostly on TNG as a kid, and it wasn't until, you know many moons ago when I was in college that I got into DS nine and I had, I had to lug around the seven seasons of DVDs to watch oh it. My God. But I'm telling you since in, in those many moons ago, since then, I think I've watched through DS nine, like I think seven or eight times and I'm watching through it again. And every time I watch it, it never ceases to amaze me how good the writing is, how incredible the cast was and every one of those characters, um, it's yeah. it's I, I think a lot of people are seeing that difference now that DS9 is not the black sheep. It's not, you know, the stepchild of Star Trek. It is its own thing. And to people who say, oh, well, they never went anywhere. Well, that's BS. They went plenty of places. But yeah. the fact that they didn't have to worry about a new planet of the week every every week for an episode, they got a chance to do that character development, that focus. And there were a lot of incredible episodes focused on your character, Major Kira. And besides duet, are there certain things that they focused on in your character that really stood out to you that you liked a lot? Well, I think everything that they looked at from my past and that gave them, you know, that was like riches for the writers to think that I had been a terrorist and, you know, that I had this traumatic past and also close friendships from, you know, from those days. I think that was great fodder for stories um and i loved it i also loved the silly ones that were just you know what was it um was it dr bashir i presume or oh something, yeah something like that that was the bond takeoff yes it was oh, yeah. to do i mean it just doesn't get better to be allowed to do a bad russian accent and <laughs> have, you know appear on a round bed it's just like it's so silly it was so fun well All i was gonna we're fun yeah i was gonna say you did you did uh several i want to say iterations of kira right you had that iteration on the holodeck which wasn't kira but you know what i mean you also got to play the intendant like an evil version of kira in the mirror universe yeah. that i thought was awesome you played a young terrorist kira uh, you know, you played Colonel Kira. I mean, there were so many iterations and I would imagine as an actress that would have been kind of freeing to be able to kind of expand your your skills, right? It's just like Disneyland. It's <laughs> like you get to do everything. It's like being in a theater company mm. with theater company quality actors 
I mean, Renee, Avery, Andy, it, it was just, it, everybody was, was incredible, really incredible at what they did. It's so, so amazing. And we did them so fast. You know, when I, when I look back at it, not in terms of hours, but in terms of work produced and just ground out, I don't know how we did it. I don't know how we did it. Wow. Well, you were that talented. That's why yeah. I mean, you, you, were, you had well, to. It was fun. It was fun. You know, uh, being on set and doing scenes with Rene Auberginois isn't half bad. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So did you guys were in the flow state <laughs> right here. <there. laughs> yeah. yeah. Was there a strong sense of like community and family working with everybody? It's, it's interesting. I mean, we said it on set that we spent more time with each other than we did our own families. Mm. And yet it's not a family. It's a work family. And it's very specific and different. We didn't really, it was like, probably more like being soldiers together without mm -hmm. having to worry about, you know, being shot at, but it, it's that we're in this difficult situation together and we're, you know, we're going to make it as good as we can, but really where we got to know each other was after the show mm -hmm. was going to conventions in Europe or Australia and hanging out and, going where are you going to dinner let's go and it's just like it's like having cousins that you lived with for a while and you meet up with once you know it's just you share so much so that dinner is so important or the jokes are so deep <laughs> yeah now on ds9 i think one of the one of the greatest villains in all of Star Trek was on there, and that's Goldacott. And Mark Alimo, who was unbelievable on that. You you two had a, a very distinct chemistry on that series. Not obviously in the chemistry of a romantical, because that your characters were not that way, but a very unique chemistry in the way that you guys played off each other. And I'm just curious on your thoughts on you know, how that went on as, as time went on, as, as your characters became more and more and more intertwined as that series evolved. Yeah. I, I think that the evolution for me was at first I saw him as, you know, it was almost as if he were an adult and I was a child, he mm. had authority and I couldn't get over that. And I wanted to attack him to, the point where Kira grows and now they're equals and she grows some more and now he's kind of erased for her. Uh, so he, he changed size because she did hmm. in her mind. That's how I saw it. But at first he was terrifying. Yeah. That's that's good. And you, the character of Kira is a mentor, I believe, right to Goldicott's daughter as, yeah, as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So that really changed the relationship. We couldn't hold on to Zial's. Uh, the no, I know, and that was it. So it, nothing could really build. And then after a while, I think it was like, oh well, you know, this isn't mm. going to work. But I think, look. Being young and being put in that makeup and then being expected to do something with it, it's, it's mask work is really specific. And uh, Renee was a master at it. I mean, oh. it, he, he made that mask do so many things. You, you knew exactly what he was thinking, um, but it's, it's not easy. I mean, I can understand going, nope, not going to do that again. Yeah. Many years later, you uh, were a part of the DS9 documentary, What We Leave Behind, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, seeing all of you back again and, and talking about your characters. I thought it was, uh, you know, really amazing revisiting the series and, and talking about that. Did any any specific memories that you can think of bubble up as you're going through it and, and you know, adding an interview into that and, and talking about your time on the show? 
Yeah, uh, you mean when I think of what we left behind? Yes. Yeah. When you were when you were when you were shooting the documentary, was there something anything specific that like, oh yeah, I totally forgot about that, you know? And I I just uh no, not really. Uh, because don't forget, we talk about the show all the time. <laughs> That's true. And we think about it all the time. Um. So I don't think it was that. I think it was this huge excuse to hang. And for me, it was talking more to Ira than I ever had. And that's kept up now. Now we've seen each other as friends before it was like boss. And I was like, mm, no, it's my boss. But now we're friends and uh, we get together that way. And hanging on that level with him was joyful. I talked him into going, I'm sure several people talked him in, but I did my hard work to talk him into coming on the ship, on the cruise ship, Star Trek cruise ship last year. And that was really fun. That's the last place you expect to see Iris Stephen Bear. <laughs> it's just like, what? <laughs> but it was great. It was great. Oh, that's outstanding. That's fun to hear. It's fun to yeah. Hear. You've had, you've been able to reprise Kira. So Kira, I believe in, in Lower Decks, Kira, she's she's back. How's yeah. that? How's that been? That was fun. That was really fun. The the joke about keep circling the pylons. <laughs> I absolutely laughed so hard at that. I think they do a great job with that show. Um, Tawny Newsom, they're all really, really lovely people. And I owe Seth McFarlane being able to jump into that because if he hadn't used me so much on Family Guy, I mm. would not know how to hit that tone and talk faster. I just wouldn't have known how to do that. But that was his note to me. Okay, that's it. Now fast. Okay, that's it. Just say it fast. <laughs> <laughs> so that the energy is up for you know animation yeah now it it was obviously slightly different on lower decks being that you were coming into a voice over role for major cure but did you find it kind of like riding a bike you just got, got back into the character all these years later well yeah kira is never kira's right here for me so it's like mm. i just go here and there she is mm. that, that's not that's not hard um but what was hard is the tone of animation, how to make Kira just oomphed up that much so that it's right for a show like that, because that is different. So, yeah. So that's why Seth really, you know, really trained me well. All the all the weird family guy things I did for him. Yeah, I would imagine, especially in, in a role like Kira, right, because um, so much of kira there's so much facial expression and movement and everything so going back into the role but from a voiceover perspective would i think be a little bit challenging right because you're saying i've got to i've got to express this through only my voice and not my body language and my facial expressions yeah what's interesting is that you end up being more physical in front of the microphone it's like your your body has to do some kind of overdone thing of what of what you would have been like to get the sound, to get it, to get your body into your, your sound, into the sound of your voice. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's incredibly different, very different. Plus, you know, you just have someone say, okay, say this line. Okay. Say this line. And you're not working opposite another actor. Oh, that make yeah. Then that makes it challenging. Yeah. Sure. For sure. With, is there any of the um, the modern Star Trek series that are out? Are there any that that you like, especially or or all of it? Or, you know, I first of all, I'm writing a book, so on the oh, women of Star Trek, I was asked to. It wasn't something like I'd go, "Hey, you know what? <laughs> I think I'm the authority here." It was like, "Would you do this?" And I just, I said yes. So I've been writing a book about the women of Star Trek and I've watched all of them and I've never seen any of them. Wow. So this was my first time watching Voyager 
and going, oh my God, I was totally wrong about seven of nine. She's amazing. Uh, watching Discovery, I I love Discovery. I love what they did with it. Um, I'm a huge fan of um, Strange New Worlds. <laughs> Same. Yeah. It just hits all the notes. Yeah. It hits it all. It's just great Trek. I'm really glad it's there. And they all do an amazing job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a daughter. She's nine, soon to be 10. And she wants to be an actress badly. Like she really wants to be an actress. Hmm. She, we, we put her into a couple of theater camps already. She loves it. She's just oh, wow. eating it up. And, you know, and she's only nine going on 10. So things could change. But for, most of her life she loves to perform we have company over and she wants to get the microphone up and dance around and sing and uh -oh. do all this stuff and so i asked many of our our guests nana this question because i want to kind of compile them for her one day <laughs> to get it from all all these these amazingly talented people and so obviously i especially have to ask you this question what what advice would you give for a young aspiring actress somebody who is where she's at at this point i would say Think of the job of acting like being a plumber. And if that is still interesting to you, do it. What I mean is a plumber has a job to do and it and works with lots of different tools and has to collaborate with people and get information from people and then do the job. If that seems attractive, then you're set up for all the joy there is to get out of it. Hmm. But if you want to be the noun of an actress, run in the other direction. Hmm. Be the verb, not the noun. Be an actor. Okay. Very good advice. Yeah, well, Zach is Zach is thinking of how to explain <laughs> how it. How to translate <laughs> that to a 10-year-old. You could you I could know. see my brain working on screen there, Chris. I was like, wait, <laughs> how do I do? That's but cool. do you but do you understand what I mean? Yes. That? Yeah. Yeah. Because I, that's really what it is. You carry your tools with you and you go from job to job. And it isn't glamorous. Yeah. It is not glamorous. And it's hard work. So if you can think, once I open my tool chest, what I take out is my acting skills, and that's exciting. Great. Yeah. Now, uh, you are scheduled, I think, are you coming to the convention this year in Vegas, right? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah. So if you're watching or listening and you're coming to Vegas this year, please pay Nana a visit. Huh. Get, a, get, get a photo with her. Like oh, I got oh many, many, many moons ago. Many uh, moves ago, yeah, many different hair colors ago. I would, yeah, I was gonna say that that leads me to another question here in a moment, but yeah, get, get a photo with her, say hi to her, get an autograph because you definitely won't regret it. Um, that leads me to a question I did have. Uh, I, I think you had mentioned it was during the pandemic that you started your mama nana videos, yeah, and I'm curious as to what was kind of the, the driving force behind that. Like what, what made you decide to start making these little, they're, they're fantastic by the way. They're just like what, three to five minutes or so. I think the average. I try to keep it to three, but sometimes it doesn't work. Cause I know it's like, Oh, no one's going to want to listen to this. But I, I, during the pandemic, look, I've had a lot of uh, issues with, with anxiety and uh, post-traumatic stress and I've done a lot of work to figure out how to manage that. At 66 years old, I have had more time than others. And that's where the mama part comes out because I so I could hear and see the anxiety so many people have. And as, at a certain point, these are all children who just need not caretaking, but mentoring, just a thought, hey, you don't know, think of this if you want to. And that's all and that's always been my my thing. If this could help you, give give it a thought. If not, keep going. Pass doesn't matter. But I, I think that uh as an elder, that's 
what I had to share at that moment in time. And it was my job five days a week to, even if there was one person that was waiting for me to post, I wanted to be there with a quote, with a thought, with something, with a book I thought might help. Um, and that's where that came from. It's wonderful that these days there are a lot of people who share having difficulties, emotional, mental difficulties. And I think the best thing we can do is educate ourselves about the mind-body connection and our nervous system. It's like, this is the operating equipment and we know very little about it. And sometimes that causes us to suffer. So just with a little information, you can get on top of these things sometimes. So that was that was behind my thought. Yeah, well, I, th I think they're wonderful. So if if there's one request I could make, it would be to please keep doing them because I think I I do think they're reaching people. I've seen that. the comments, and I I, I there's several that I've watched, and I've watched quite a few of them. There's several that I watch where I'm like I stop and go, oh, it's like the it's like it's like about the plumber. I'm like, oh, I didn't think about it like that. Like let me let me think through, let me process that, let me let me work through that. And I think they're I think they're wonderful. So please keep doing them. Critical thinking. That's the best thing we can do. Growing our brains like that. That yeah. is that that's exciting to me. And thank you, Zach. And I will. I'll make one tomorrow. That's great. Yeah. Just I think because that, you said so. Thank you. Yes. And so that goes back to what, what you mentioned about many hairstyles ago. You have a lot of hairstyles in your videos, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you see my hair growing out from uh I mean, I just at I don't know when it was, but I just went, I'm going to go by natural color. So I just cut all my hair off to do it that way. Some people grow it out. I just was like, mm, I've had short hair before. Let's just go extreme, get rid of it and go from there. So you see it growing out over the years. Yeah. Well, you had, um, you definitely had short hair in the first few seasons of DS9 as Cure, right? And then they changed her hairstyle. I want to say it was like season five maybe or something or maybe late season four i know it, it was definitely a ways into the run was it yeah, yeah i think so i can't remember but i do remember in in one of our they did a reel kind of like a blooper reel i wish i knew where these things went but they disappeared uh for a lunch at the end of a season and they did just <laughs> fun thing of all my hairstyles <laughs> that show so far and it was like just a quick thing of one hairstyle after another it was pretty funny oh that would be awesome to see that <laughs> yeah quick yeah quick cuts of different hairstyles would be awesome it the the mom and the not nah, I, I i agree with you and i agree with zach those are those are beautiful to share with with people thank um, you be, because our world is getting it's not getting less complicated and, and, you know, anxiety is rising amongst everyone. Um, and I, I know that um, when you've, you've talked about the flow state and you've, you've talked about mindfulness and you've, you've developed all of, you've learned so much. Um, and then in your experience in meditation too, I, I, and, and I wonder if you would share like how, how now, like the being able to find mindfulness, being able to, to meditate, how that helps you, how that can help others. If you wouldn't mind sharing with us a little bit of that now, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, it's yeah. it's made me the biggest change for me is learning to be compassionate with myself. And that's over and over and over again, because it's something that is ground out of us. It, it's like this wrong thing to do, but self-compassion allows you to feel shame in failing and try again self-compassion allows you to let go of those that you know wound up worry that happens at two in the morning um it it allows you to understand compassion for other people and compassion is so interesting can, can i just go off on one thing please. Really? yes please I'll absolutely as quickly as i can so sympathy and i read this and it makes so much sense to me. Sympathy is when you feel sorry for somebody, but you definitely see them on a different hierarchical level than you. 
and you're not going to necessarily help them. It's like saying, oh, poor thing. Mm, oh, that thing. There's a thing that I see people do this, mm, which I cannot stand because to me, that's sympathy. You're not going to do anything. You have no intention to help, but you are making a gesture like patting someone on the head. Then there's empathy where your nervous system feels the same thing that someone in pain, someone who's suffering feels, and you can feel the pain they feel. That's really useful on your way to compassion. Now, when you feel compassion for someone and firefighters feel compassion, if they felt empathy when they were looking at a burning building, it would incapacitate them. They would get overwhelmed going, oh my God, it's so horrible what they're going through. They cannot act. Compassion is when you can empathize and move through that to saying, I intend to help them. And the minute you do that, when you say, I am going to do something to end this suffering in a small way or a big way, your brain starts working differently. Mm. You get different chemicals being shot into your body, things to help you focus, things to help you have that energy to do whatever it is to run into that burning building. So compassion is a physically very strong state. Empathy is like an implosion most of the time. So moving through, em and sympathy is nasty to me. So I don't sympathize with people. I I do empathize, but mostly I want to work to compassion. Hmm. Yeah. Well, if I can suggest, uh, based on your mom and Anna videos, maybe you should write a book, another book. <laughs> And we could call Let me it. Finish uh, this book. Yeah, finish that <laughs> one. And you could do a book called like uh, Musings with Mama Nana or something like that, right? And yeah. just each chapter, you talk about a different topic that, like, you do in your videos and write out how you feel about that or things you found or research. And that's a cool idea. I would read it. That's I would a very absolutely cool idea. read it because I think, I mean, you, 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 you have a, a, a very vast reach because of, of the things that you've done. And the impact that you've had in people's lives, I think a book like that, people would read it and I think it would help quite a bit. I love that thought. Yeah. I love that thought. I'm going to file that in there. There you go. Yeah. Uh, when you were on Broadway in the early 2000s, right? Because I remember, I think it was on the Shuttle Pod show, you had mentioned a, a, about being on Broadway and then 9 11 happened. Yeah. And you guys went back to work, I think pretty quickly after 9-11 and I'm, I'm curious if you would share kind of what your thoughts were and how things what things were racing through your mind at the time that was happening it was interesting because what what you have to remember is we didn't know what was happening now 9-11 was like that was the event and that was it but at the time we were looking up into the sky going what's next what's happening next where are they hitting us next and Times Square is so iconic that we were pretty sure that's what was going to get hit. And that's what, because I used to call myself a performer. And a performer has a certain kind of quality to it um, that is, well, it's performative. It's like, you know, I'll sing and dance. Um, and when 9-11 happened, the boys, my sons, used to come to the theater with me, which my husband, who was a company manager at the time, it, we weren't married, but he was like, you do not have your children in the theater. There's all kinds of wrong reasons. You cannot have children in your dressing room. But I did, because otherwise it, it was just too limited of t time. But when we were called back, I had this moment with myself of going... I can't bring the boys. Mm. It was like, why can't I bring the boys? Because we might get hit and they might die. So why are you going to the theater? <laughs> and I went, because that's what we do. We get on stage and we make people feel that everyone's standing back up and we're going to be okay. And that's important for New York 
And that's important for the United States. We're going back to work. And realizing that made me go, oh, I'm, I'm a storyteller. I'm someone who helps people stand back up when they need to. And uh, it was, it was, a t it was, I mean, you know, we're, it, we're a fun musical about murder and mayhem, you know, and they had it coming, all these songs about death and ha ha. And there were, you know, there were people who, there were firefighters and soldiers who came from all over the country to help. And they were sent to the theater for the night to try to take their minds off of what they had been doing all day. And there would be maybe 200 people in a theater that held so many more. And they would just be looking at us with blank eyes and they'd come backstage with blank eyes, blank, just blank. And it was heartbreaking and hard. It was a hard time. And it was scary because I did think we were going to get hit. Mm. But it defined my job <laughs> in a way different way than I had ever thought of it before. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That, that is so much resilience and like an understanding of what you can contribute to the to the audience and, and the people and making them feel I think that's what yeah. compassion yeah. does. Yeah. It makes you travel past yourself and travel past what you're worried about about your survival and going, no, this is what we do for each other. Yeah, you're yeah. truly serving them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh there is an episode of D Space Nine that I think is maybe one of the greatest written shows in television history not just d space nine or star trek and that's far beyond the stars i knew you knew you're gonna say that, that. yeah yes, you because knew you're right you're it's, right could yeah. that not have been a movie oh my gosh i mean i i i, I still to this day feel like deep space nine should have gotten a movie at least one right yeah. after it was over i mean i mean kira becomes the command of the station when cisco goes off with the wormhole aliens or the prophets um, and, but that, that episode was so impactful. It's so moving. Um, I, I, I must confess when I was younger, there are certain episodes I would skip over cause they were too slow for me, but yeah. as I'm older and I have a family, these things hit harder. Yeah. And I'm curious in that episode, cause again, it's another, another version of Kira kind of that you're getting to play in this, in this era, there was a story, uh, I think that was told, I want to say it was on the, maybe the documentary or something I heard where, um, Avery got so deep into that character, and I think he directed the episode too. I believe um, that he 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 spent you know forty minutes or twenty minutes, whatever, was on the floor crying after they said cut. And I'm curious on the maybe the impact that that episode had on you, and maybe the cast as a whole moving forward. It well, we were living with Mr. Brooks. And Mr. Brooks is nothing if he's not a teacher and a mm. mentor. And it was like having a history lesson, uh, a sensitivity lesson, you know, why diversity is important lesson mm. every, all the time. I mean, that that was the work that he was driven to do is to share what he shared with many people with that episode. But um, yeah, it was, it wasn't like, oh my God, it was like, yes, this is, this is the horror and pain. And, and um, yeah, made it, made a big difference in my life working with Avery for seven years. I learned so much we would talk about something on set, there would be a book two days later in my trailer, the book that we were talking about. Mm. And I'd read it and then we'd have discussions about it. He can't help but be a professor. It's what, you know, it's just in him. He's a teacher, he's a mentor. And he taught me so much. Yeah. He, he, he became a, 
college professor after DS9, I believe, right? I think he was I teaching think he music was or that something. Before, no, oh, I yeah. think he was working acting. Rutgers teaching acting. Yeah, mm. that's it. wow. That's Inter why everyone calls me Nana because no one. I was thirty five years old. No one ever asked me how I liked my name. Said they said it however they wanted to, but Avery said how. When he met me, how do you like your name pronounced? It's like, what? And I thought, well, I like it the way my mother says it. And she was French. And it really, within two weeks, and I never said a word, everyone was calling me Nana because of Avery. Because that's the way he was with everybody. Everybody on set. He knew everyone's name. Crew. If you just came in once, he knew who you were. He was like that with fans, too, at conventions. I met him several times many years ago, and his line would always take the longest because <laughs> he because you go up to him and he would look at you in the eyes. He would shake your hand, ask you ask who your, your, what your name was, where you're from. He'd have a conversation with you. And it'd be, before you know, it's 10 minutes and then he's finally signing you know, the autograph and it, or, or whatever, you know, and it's just that kind of care. Like it I went to the fans as well, which I think was, was fantastic. Yeah. He's, he's that way with everybody, but that's such an important moment. It can't be like this. That's an important moment. And it's not about us. When someone comes to get a, an autograph, that's about them. Finally, they've seen you so many times in their living room, now they get to look in your eyes and say, this is what you meant to me. And they close this loop for themselves. And you have to bear witness to that. It's not about me. It's about their lives. Well, I will say the, the number of times I've met you, it's always been absolutely a delight uh you know coming up to you talking to you you're very personable you can i can tell and i think others can tell how much you care about the fans and and them and who they are so i i appreciate that because you know some people don't always have the greatest experiences when they meet their heroes or meet people they've seen on tv uh and every experience i've ever had with you has been absolutely a pleasure i'm so glad i'm glad to hear that good because it should be that way yeah. You know, unless someone has a stomach ache or you know, <laughs> they're like they're grumpy because they have a stomach ache. Why wouldn't you be present for this human in front of you? I yeah, it's hard to understand. Well, speaking of like of heroes, and, and I'm so glad I didn't know that you were asked to write a book. Um, and I'm really happy that you are asked to write a book Thank because you. yeah, because Kara Kira is a she's a role model, period and a very, very critical leader in all of Star Trek, just a leader and, and a role model. And I love asking this questions, and I'm, I'm, and I'm curious because we, we've learned so much about you, and it's, it's beautiful. But like, and as you think about your book and what will be in your book, who are your role models growing up right now? Who, who helped influence you? Uh, well, my mother was a huge role model. She was a different thinker and a different kind of woman. And I respected her deeply. And now my role models are these young women that I've been interviewing. Sonequa Martin-Green, the astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti, uh, uh, it, M M Melissa on um, Melissa Navia on Strange New Worlds. I'm, I learn so much from these young women who go, well, why, what, why would I, why would I be like that? Why would I be anyone other than who I am? A, why would I ask my husband to help me with my children when they're his children too? <laughs> it's, you don't help if they're your children. You you just are with your children. It's like, and these are mind blowing concepts for me because I'm caught in the cultural amber that was the nineties. Still, no matter how much I go, no, that's times have changed. I don't like that. I don't want that. Still, you know, Kira was my projection of the freedom I wanted, not the freedom I felt. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. 
So DS9 not only was so vastly different when it came along, I, I, I've said for many, many, many years, I don't think that show would have been made if Gene Roddenberry were still alive because it was a much different outlook on the future than what he envisioned. Yeah. Um, it was labeled dark and gritty, although if you look at it now, it's like, no, it really wasn't. I mean, you know, maybe if you compare it to TNG, kind of. But uh, Kira was arguably the most different female character to come along in Star Trek at that time. And I'm curious, uh, Nana, what what major things, if there's a couple of things that you could pinpoint that you took away from Kira and said, yeah, that I want, I, I learned this from this character or, or I'm going to take this with me as I go out the rest of my life and my career. What can you maybe pin down a couple of things that you really took away? Yeah. It's like drilling down into some heavy stuff. It's duet affected me. Mm -hmm. Duet really affected me. The story affected me thinking about the story, thinking of how many times even Passing a mother angry with a child in the street and the child is screaming and I go, oh, bad mother, out of control. And how wrong that is, because that's just my perspective. There are, if my paradigm shifts and I know that, you know, whatever the story is, she's doing exactly what she needs to be doing with that child. You know, it it made me aware of those moments. It made me not so certain. I think that was the biggest takeaway for, for Kira that I took was certainty is black and white is, it, it just really doesn't exist in the real world. It's mostly the most, and the older I get, the most truthful thing I can say is, I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think maybe not get anywhere closer to certain. That's and Kira taught me that. Duet taught me that. The way it looks isn't necessarily the way it is. Stop a minute. Yeah, and I think you saw that throughout the this the show as she she's very, very very set on a certain way of doing things and certain principles and the way she sees the world. And as the series goes on, some of that changes and, and she, she grows. And I mean, obviously it's a testament to those writers and to you as an actress portraying that character, but you see that growth over seven seasons. And I, I, I feel like where they left her at the end of DS nine, I felt was in a really good place. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I thought that she was, very powerful and grounded and had taken in the deep experience of that arc. I agree. Because, you know, early on, I just saw this show where Dax, there's this universe that attaches itself to her ship as she comes, the runabout as she comes in and it's growing exponentially mm -hmm. and it's, you know, and I'm like, kill him. You know, gotta kill him. <laughs> I come a long way. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Um, yeah. So, well, Nana, we we really thank you for your time. This this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, Same here. We really, really do appreciate it. We're very humbled to have you on. Um, you you have been and continue to be an iconic role within the Star Trek franchise, and you know, portraying Major Kira. Um, it's it's inspiring and you know for someone who has a nine-year-old daughter who's you know not quite interested in star trek stuff yet because she, i don't think she quite gets it when she's old enough she's watching d space nine and she's going to get a chance to that's see it. kira in that role model so that's it good good yeah. and then tell her about the plumber then i will <laughs> there you go that'll be a perfect time <laughs> that'll be a perfect time so um yeah well chris this has been awesome um i i i couldn't have asked for a better time Thank you so much. Thank you for being you and sharing all of it, what you're Thanks. able to share. You so yeah, I appreciate and, you both. Thank you, Nana. And we we look forward to more Mama Nana videos. We look forward to your book coming out in the I'm near gonna future. do one tomorrow. I'm gonna do awesome. one tomorrow. Yeah. And then uh who knows, maybe more books down the road. 
that would be awesome Sounds too. Great. So, all right. Well, thank you everybody so much for watching and listening all over the, the, the globe and the interwebs, Chris. We really do appreciate it. And uh, if you've not checked us out before, check us out on Facebook and Instagram. And we'll catch you next time right here on the Random Redshirt Podcast.